Coming up on this episode of DL Weekly, more magic comes to Genie Plus. Indiana Jones gets scheduled for some TLC celebrating Hispanic and Latin American culture. A date is set for popular holiday events. Grab some authentic Cajun flavors. And we continue our discussion with Imagineer Greg Combs and more. DL Weekly starts now. Ah, oh, buenos dias, senorita. My siestas are getting shorter and shorter. Oh, look at all the people listening. Welcome to DL Weekly's Enchanted Podcast. Hey, Tag and Teresa, mi amigos, pay attention, it's show time. Hello and welcome to this episode of DL Weekly for the week of October 5th, 2022. I'm Teresa Urban. And I'm Tag Bushman. We want to send a shout out and a big thank you to Kara Dibbs for becoming an official weekly tier on our Patreon. Our supporters get some pretty fun perks like DL Weekly swag, bonus content, access to our Discord community, and more. If you would like some more Disney magic in your day, head on over to dlweekly.net slash support to join the community. Well, it's that time again for our friend Eric over at Concierge to catch us up on other Disney news. Hello, everyone. This is Eric Johnson with Concy Ears, and welcome to the D180. While Tech and Teresa cover all things Disneyland in the D180, we take a spin around the rest of the Disney universe, and we do it in 180 seconds. Let's jump right in. We start our journey in Walt Disney World, where some relatively new favorites are returning to the Magic Kingdom and Hollywood Studios. Disney After Hours allows guests to visit these two parks for several hours at the end of the night. Once the main park hours are over, guests who purchase these tickets can stick around and enjoy significantly lower crowd levels. Cruise through queues and enjoy some of the park's most popular attractions. Sick of two-hour waits for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train? Think you'd like Slinky Dog Dash a little better if that line were non-existent? These after-hours events are your ticket to mastering Disney World's greatest attractions in as little time as possible. Oh, and ice cream, popcorn, beverages, and other treats are included in the ticket price, too. Speaking of tickets, this is definitely one of those hard-ticket attractions we should be used to by now. Tickets go on sale starting October 7th. If you have reservations at a Disney World Resort hotel, you can buy early starting October 7th. Fourth, Yes, it even counts if you're staying at the Swan and Dolphin or Shades of Green resorts. After Hours Nights are currently scheduled select nights at Hollywood Studios from January 4th through April 19th, 2023. Magic Kingdom Nights run January 9th through March 27th, 2023. A full list of dates and attractions is available on Disney World's site, but why not just call one of our concierge to walk you through it? I mean... Even the prices change based on the park and the date. We'll make it a little bit easier for you. Disney World and the Disney Cruise Line ships on the eastern seaboard are still recovering from Hurricane Ian. It's always amazing to see these stories come out of natural disasters at Disney parks. I am sure guests who were there during the worst of the storm were kept safe and entertained, even though they couldn't enjoy the parks. So let's head overseas a bit. We heard a lot about what the Asian parks have in store during the recent D23 Expo. Frankly, it's more than we have confirmed here in the American parks, but let's not worry about that. That's a different podcast. One of the projects that's the furthest along is the creation of a new Frozen-themed land in Hong Kong Disneyland. The mountains of Arendelle are taking shape and so are the land's castles. Wandering Oaken's Sliding Sleighs, the first Frozen-themed roller coaster, will come online late next year. We can't wait to see this unique and new attraction and land. Hong Kong Disneyland started out as a budget park, but it's poised to be a new must-see destination for sure. And that's 180 seconds. I hope you enjoyed our quick spin around the rest of the Disney universe. If you'd like to learn more about these Disney adventures or just have a few questions, please come on over. Visit the social media and websites of both DL Weekly and us, their official travel planners, Kanzi Ears. We look forward to planning something special for you and yours. I'm Eric Johnson, and this has been your D180. Thanks, Eric. Now let's get to Disneyland's news. Disney 
is putting more of its magic on your phones to capture some magical moments. Guess who by Genie Plus will now have access to special augmented reality or AR lenses. You'll find food, characters, and other looks like Snorkeling with Nemo. After buying Genie Plus, guests can find these lenses in their Disneyland app under More. Some are tied to specific locations in the resort and some aren't available to guests who are under 18. But access to some of these lenses can carry on at home 45 days after using Genie Plus in the park. Well, that's kind of neat that you can do some stuff uh, in at home like you could in the park. Lenses. This is interesting because these I, are almost like those magical moments that you get with PhotoPass people, but of, you do it for your phone, right? Kind of. I have my biggest gripe with this. Okay, we'll start positive first. I think this is fun. Sure. And, you know, why not, right? But I don't like that it's behind a paywall. I wish that maybe this was something that just anybody would be able to access because I don't to me this isn't a big enough benefit to justify purchasing genie plus does Hmm. that make sense like I sure with genie plus I get photo pass I would much rather photo pass photographers taking my pictures and having those professional photos and taking photos myself that then has some I mean is it I think it's fun for sure it is fun but I just don't I don't like that it's available only through genie plus yeah, adding it to Genie Plus. Do you think that this is because like they're trying to give more carrots to people to come and purchase the Genie they Plus service or what? Must they must? I don't know. I mean, it's right. They're trying to. I don't know. Yeah, beef up the reason. You know, the reason to. I. I just it doesn't make sense to me because if Genie Plus didn't come with Photo Pass, then I could see this having more quote unquote value. But since Genie Plus has Photo Pass, I just don't know. I don't know. It's something fun to do, but I just I just don't see the value. Hmm. Yeah. I don't see I don't see the paid value for it. I guess would be a good way of explaining it. This would be something cool if like it just came with your ticket. Like so, maybe these were available when only when you're in the park and o- like only when you're scanned into the park. Sure. I like that they're special and that's not just something that anybody can access at any time because they've done like. They've done these kind of filters before where you sure. can access them from home or, you know, whatever. But I think it, it would be cool if it was specific to the park. So you had to be in the park to be able to use it. But I just, yeah, I'm not a fan of it only being available to guests that have paid for Disney+. Plus. Sure. Now, one of the things with lenses just in general, like Snapchat's had different filters and lenses and stuff. Yeah. And the same thing with Instagram and stuff like that. What What is funny to me is crouch the old man me... <laughs> doesn't understand and it seems complicated to find kind of what you're looking for especially on like snapchat however i will say once i figure out how to go somewhere and find it i find myself laughing and just enjoying the ridiculousness of the system so it is kind of funny to me like i think they're definitely catering to a certain certain demographic people i do think that the weirdest part is like you said the fact that they're housing it under genie plus is the weirdest part to me Mm -hmm. otherwise it's kind of cool i wish that they just had this as part of your ticket and just like on the phone but yeah it it'll be interesting i'll i'm curious if this will always live and be linked to genie plus or if you know maybe they're just starting this way and if it will eventually just be part of something that anybody is able to access in a you know that just comes with admission to the parks or something but yeah one other thing i will add to this too is i wish they would stop cramming more stuff into the disneyland app and fixed stuff that's already in the Disneyland app. Like, for instance, one thing that I'm still waiting for them to bring is when I make a reservation on our annual pass or our magic key, it'd be nice to do that in the app instead of it bumping me to the website. Can't they add that and not worry about this type of stuff? But this is the flashier stuff. This is the stuff that people are going to get excited about. It helps uh, make it a better value, I guess, for GD+. Some much-needed love is coming to our favorite adventuring archaeologist. Indiana Jones is going down for refurbishment on November 14th. We're not sure how long or how much is being done, but we're hoping to see more consistency out of things like the boulder and, of course, the snake that hasn't worked forever. Yeah, there's quite a few things that, unfortunately, have not been working top-notch 100% for a while. And I just feel bad because poor Indy, right? It's It's such a great attraction. Yes. But... Because it's such a great and popular attraction, I think it's harder for Disney to justify putting it down for an extended period of time so that it gets the TLC that it so desperately 
needs and deserves. So, you know, just things like things like the interactive queue is ve- been very hit or miss for quite a while. Yep. But then there's even also other show elements that I was reading about that some of these show elements haven't worked for a long, long while. And one of the big ones is, and I was actually trying to think back. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I have a memory of experiencing this, but when you f- first go in, so right, you get in your transport, your Jeeps, your transport vehicles. Yep. And you go in that first room, there's three doors. Well, it used to appear that you would go through one of the three doors. Yep. You'd go to, there was a left, middle, and a right. Well, now it's only ever the middle door. That And it was this really cool effect that they made it appear. Of course, you wouldn't actually go into three different right. rooms. They just made it, you, they made it look and feel and appear as though you did. I don't know if I can honestly say I have a memory of experiencing hmm. that. That's how long that has not been tip top working condition. Right. So there's there's some big things. There's also some little things. The one that I just can't get over is the snake. The snake feels like it should be a pretty important straightforward effect to have working correctly. And it's a very important thing. I remember that was actually one of the reasons when I was little, I was terrified of going Indiana into Indiana Jones because I heard that there was a snake. And I snakes are not my thing. So you and Indiana Jones are yep. one with this one. Yes, yes. So like I have a distinct memory. My first visit to Disneyland of sitting first ride of the or first attraction of the entire trip, and little Teresa sat outside because she heard that there was a snake in Indiana oh. Jones, and I refused to go on. So I have a very distinct memory. I have a really weird connection to the snake. <laughs> so this is like your connection it's like to haunted the haunted mansion. Yeah, to the same haunted trip, mansion guy. Same trip. I was very terrified. How did you trip. ever go back to Disneyland? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I saw. So somebody had posted this. I first saw this news reported. Somebody had posted a link in Reddit on Reddit. There's a Disneyland subreddit. Sure. And there's some people who know and talk to cast members, and so this is. By no means fact, but I'm just going to pass along stuff that I learned from comments on this particular post that I thought was interesting. One, the apparently, according to a cast member in the know, the snake that is there currently is a temporary snake because they've already sent the broken snake out to like get repaired. So they've just put a temporary one that does not move there. They are already working on that, I guess the effect that you were talking about where the, where basically the wall moved the room. Yeah. The, the, the first the, room. The, the, yeah. The, and the way, the way that that worked, spoiler alert, that it'll never work again, by the way, is the, is the fact on that one, which is because they've spent all this money now on projection technology that makes it look better. But what the way it used to work is it's kind of like the boulder effect where, Obviously, you, the track does not move. You're going to still go up the same same hallway and everything, and they just make it look different. What it was was the three doors was kind of on a pivot, so it would actually roll. So it would look like you were going in the far left door or the far right door or the middle door, depending on how they did it. And, and mirrors, too. There was mirrors involved. And there well. was the mirror for when you're in the station. You could see in the reflection of the mirror that the doors were moving. That's how you could – or mm-hmm. it looked like the door was was moving or something. And so the the important thing here with that is – Somebody was talking about how what it is, is there's a special part that was manufactured by a company that has now gone out of business. And for them to remanufacture this part would be so costly. And they've already done the projection that they're never going to fix this particular effect. Mm. There's some other effects that I don't even remember seeing like there's you. like the bridge. There's like, cause the bridge used to like rumble. There's too. a section where it looks like rock is falling from the ceiling oh, when yeah. you first come around that first corner. I've never seen that work. There's some other effects. There's some effects that just never quite worked right. Like you have the, the rats dropping into you. Any of those like kind of missed effect things never quite worked right. But yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping that this is the refurbishment that we were scheduled to get before COVID happened. Mm-hmm. Remember, they were going to replace the bridge and do all this stuff. So all I know is I love this attraction. I really, really, really hope that they do a wonderful job with it. And I hope that it comes back looking tip top shape and we don't have to I don't have to feel like I don't want to ride it anymore because some of the effects aren't well, working. And really, that's that's the sad part about Indy. Indy used to be our first attraction and and sometimes our last attraction the last i i'm trying to think i think the last time we did that was 2019 the d23 trip yep. for 2019 since then with with things not working we'll do it at some point in the trip but we don't feel the same 
draw to Indy Correct. as we used to, I guess would be a good way of saying it. In fact, I've been very happy because our first and last attractions have been, not intentionally, but have seemingly been um, Haunted Mansion now. Sure. Did, so, did we even... We did go on Indy this last trip. We did. Yeah. Well, I guess this last trip, it was our last attraction. Yeah, but... But that wasn't like on purpose. It just it happened was our, to be it that was way. Our last attraction. It was the only time that we rode it. Yeah. So yeah, Whereas for me, was... it used to be a tradition, first and last, and that was that. But um, what I found over the last few times has been sometimes it's not open first thing in the morning, yeah. so it can't be the first thing. And then sometimes you know you go over to get on it, and it's closed because something has gone down. So anyway, I'm really really hoping that that they fix a lot of these problems with it and that it is improved. By the way, we were on Quick Diz Takes this last week, uh, Teresa and I, and one of the folks on there is a huge dinosaur fan, and he said that they were that they had updated their dinosaur attraction, which runs on the same stuff that the Disneyland Indiana Jones Adventure runs on. So it's interesting to think that 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 may have improved because I know we've kind of poo-pooed that before, or at least I've poo-pooed that before on the podcast. So just since we were talking to Indiana Jones, I wanted to throw that in there. Well, we are in the middle of Hispanic and Latin American Heritage Month at the Disneyland Resort. Now through October 15th, a mix of cultural festivities, including near nightly live music, inspired food dishes, Latina owned food trucks, arts and crafts, decor and merch will grace downtown Disney and the parks. You can even pick up the Play Disney Parks app for some limited time trivia. Over in DCA, you can find the annual Plaza de la Familia celebration inspired by Coco and the amazing amazing show that they put on multiple times a day with the like life-size puppets and oh, dancers yes. and singing and such a good show if you haven't experienced it 1000 times recommend going over there to see it it's so so fun i'm glad that they're doing this for this hispanic and latin american heritage month but at the same time i kind of wish this show stuck around like all the time because it is such it's a great so show good. The uh, the puppets that are part of it, the actors, like they're just they're just really into it. Mm -hmm. It's so lively. Is this the same one? Why am I confusing this now? Is this the same one that we went and saw yeah. further down? Okay. No. What do you mean further down? This is the exact same exact same thing that we we didn't watch it this year, but during Halloween time last year. What we did we it. watch that we were hanging out by the food places there, and the people like ran right by us as they went out to do their? Oh, you're thinking about what is it? Fiesta Navidad. It's the 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 holiday time. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I'm getting because it's, it's like around a, the same like area. It's a street party. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. This is not that. That's good. Okay. I just because for some reason those two things were blending together for me. But I remember with this one, you do have to kind of get there before the show because mm -hmm. if you want to be able to see everything so clearly, it is kind of a limited space over there, and so many people want to watch it because they are all very excited, just like oh, Teresa. Crap! What was that? What is it? it's not Fiesta Navidad? What is it called? The Viva Navidad Street Party. That's what it's called. Yeah. So the fact that there's some cool stuff in the trivia for the Play Disney Parks app is kind of a neat thing to kind of add to that. And, of course, we've got all the stuff going on in downtown Disney, like the Saletas that are still there. Mm -hmm. Tons of food. There is a foodie guide just for... Did we link the just, foodie guide? Just for this event as well. We will make sure to link that in the notes. But some of the highlights and some of the things... This was going on when we were just there for D23, but we got... We, I don't think we got distracted by other things and forgot to report on this new foodie guide, but it actually came out soon after the Halloween time foodie guide. But some things that we were excited about and wanted to try over at the Plaza de la Familia, which is at the Paradise Garden Grill. I was really excited and wanted to try. They have a chorizo quesadilla, which is poblano onions and mozzarella topped with cilantro and served with a salsa roja. It's actually plant-based chorizo, so I really wanted to try that. That Ooh. sounded really delicious. Remember, we ran we ran over there, but they were closed. Yes. So I wasn't able we to try it. We went to get it. in line, and they were like, sorry, they, yep, the line was, Yep, the line had been cut off. And then the other thing, too, which we did have last year and is returned this year is the cocoa cake. Layers of vanilla cake with cinnamon mousse and ice with cream cheese frosting. So this is even though it says new it's the same thing from it, last year it, well maybe unless they've changed the recipe but hmm. i think it's the same from last year but basically this is like a churro cake the only thing it's missing is pieces of churro which in the it was filling, great but yum 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 and the last thing that i wanted to try that they were all out of when we were there is over at boardwalk pizza and pasta they have a 
an orchata cheesecake that yes. I really wanted to try. And I was asking all the cast members if they had it. And they're like, oh, if it's not out in the cooler, we're all out. And I was bummed and sadly ate my breadsticks instead. <laughs> Which were not Which not were not, good. no. Nowhere near as good. Yeah. Like uh, Teresa said, we'll link that in the show notes as well. So you can check out the foodie guide for that. All sorts Oops. of yummy, yummy, delicious foods. I mean, we always talk about And the, the other thing that that's, we'll make sure to link to is the they have listed, there's all sorts of music and entertainment happening in downtown Disney related to this celebration as well. So I, there's just something something about downtown Disney and having the live music there. It's just, yeah. it's just the energy, the feeling. It's just awesome. And I am very excited that when they do the redo – of downtown Disney. I was just going to say far that. Side. I'm so excited that they're going to have a bigger, it looks to be a bigger stage and bigger area to kind of view and experience and be able to hang out. Well, a nice spot these. that you can sit like on a grassy area. That's going to be great. Cause right now it's all concrete. That too. The popular candlelight processional makes its return in two months. Mark your calendars for December 3rd and 4th. If you want to see the carolers, live music and surprise narrator. We'll see who they bring in to follow up actor Sterling K. Brown. I this this is something definitely on my Disney bucket list. We've never happened to be in the parks during when this goes on. But it just it seems so fun, so festive. I know there's a lot of weekly tiers that have been able to experience this, weekly tiers that are able to do this every year and it's kind of almost be it's become their own holiday tradition. Mm-hmm. But it just it looks like Something so, so cool. We were so close last year because we were there, but we didn't have park reservations. So we watched the lights from yep. the Esplanade. That's as close as we've gotten. <laughs> it, was, it was not nearly as We got grand. to see the back of the trumpeters up on top of yes, the yes. Main Street Station and everything. Yeah, I would like to see this. Mm-hmm. It's just such a spectacle. And yeah. it's something that's only done for a couple nights. Um, and, and of course, special. when you are in the parks on December 3rd and 4th, if you happen to be there during this time, if you're not watching the Candlelight Processional, it is a very challenging area to get through on Main Street there just because everybody's trying to get a glimpse of it. So yeah. just be aware that the evening of the 3rd and 4th might be a good time to either park hop over to DCA or to stay further into the park and mm-hmm. kind of avoid if you're not trying to get a, a view of this. But, yeah, um, avoid Main Street and the It's on my Square. bucket list, though. Mm-hmm. I would also like to mm-hmm. One of these years, it. one of these years, we'll see it and experience it. Yeah, but we also, there'd be so much planning involved because you got to make sure you get there and get a good seat. Oh, yeah. And I just don't even know how we would do it. We'd do it. We would, Disney magic, that's Disney how magic, <laughs> as always. Well, Tiana's secret stuff has finally made it over to Eudora's Chic Boutique in New Orleans Square. You can get your hands on some hot sauce, spices, and other New Orleans food mixes. Here we have some Cajun gumbo base that's available, some praline mix. Cafe du Monde coffee. Oh, that's like chicory. It's like a big deal. Spice Wallace spices and seasoning for twenty one ninety nine. Some gumbo seasoning, hot sauce, a Tiana Varsity jacket. That's something that's unique. <laughs> not not one of the flavors we were talking no. about in the news, but it is there as well. But yeah. Mm. So I think it's cool because it's not the what when they explained that they were gonna have Tiana's like secret spices at the chic boutique at Eudora's chic boutique. I was assuming that they would be Disney branded things. Yeah. So I thought that they would just, you know, slap, you know, Tiana's secret spice or yeah, whatever, me you too. Know, some sort of label on some other seasonings. But these look like, like you walked into a, a gift shop from New Orleans and these look, these look like they're off. It's authentic spice. It's oh, not yeah. like that Disney just slapped like a label on. Like this Cafe on. Dumont copy. Mm-hmm. It's not like Disney just slapped a label on some generic something. So I thought this was really interesting. I'm very curious to check this shop out just because it, a lot of the shops in Disneyland feel like it's just it, like Disney just is every Like everything's yeah. Disney. Everything's Disney branded. Well, which is what you would expect. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that we're getting, especially in New Orleans Square, that we're getting these kind of more like specialty shops and it's kind of going back a little bit because we used to have specialty shops like this way right. way back so i think this is a really cool full circle thing to do it's the shop itself yes is themed to disney characters yes there is some disney branded merchandise in there but i like that there's also a mix of unique 
things that aren't Disney specific. I agree. I agree. Reminder for all weekly tears. These questions can feel like a high speed roller coaster type ride in the dark with self high fives, sudden drops, and stumps. Follow all pre-launch procedures, including stowing hats, glasses, and all loose possessions in the cargo pouch located directly in front of you. Hello and welcome to Trivia Land. Today I'm excited we're going to spend all of trivia talking about an opening day attraction. Oh. Yeah, once I just got started, it just became thematic. One particular attraction or opening day attraction? One particular opening day attraction. So this could either go really well or really terrible. I hope it's not the Autopia. The Surprise! Autopia is... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Your first question. Storybook Land Canal Boats was previously oh. named blank. It was something about like... Is it Canal Boats so of the around, World? Yeah, Around the World or Of the World or... Canal Boats of the World? I think it was can- Canal Boats Around the World or Of the World, something like that. How How specific, like... Would either of those answers work, or do you want me to pick I'll, one? I'll be lenient enough. Okay, okay yeah. we'll go. I'm around. The I think world. it's of the world. Canal you boats. Of, of the world. Around, uh, canal boats around. Slash canal boats of. of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our second question: Why would someone rush to be first in line for this attraction? <gasps> oh, because they've got the, the log captain's book, the captain's log. log. I want to do that so bad. That's another Disney bucket list thing. Problem is, we have to get there early, and we have to book it back there. Mm-hmm. So you get to yeah, they get to sign the captain's log. Do they get a? Do you get like a pin or a button or anything, or is it just signing the nah, captain's log? I've, I've only heard of it being signing signing mm. the book. You still got robbed on the first Dole Whip of the I day. Oh, I did get the first Dole Whip, but they didn't. The button was not at the location I got the first Dole Whip at. Mm. In my heart, I know I got the first Dole. Whip. That's true. I agree with you. You just <laughs> of, didn't get the fancy of the thing. Tropical hideaway. Now, did you get a? Did you ever get a? I, I'm just totally taking us off track here, but did you get a? Through actual means, get a citizen of Disneyland yeah. button? Okay. Because I know some people can just, like, I just grabbed one from somebody that had one, I, but I you earned, actually earned it. Yeah, I earned mine with trivia questions is how I earned it. Oh, it's fitting. <laughs> of course you did. Our third question this week, maybe testing your Mandela effect knowledge, true oh, or false, no. <laughs> Monstro used to have a tail. False. Mm, false. I feel so much certainty from the two of you on that one. Well, because because the part of the storyline is when you go through, she says like he blew his tail right off, and then like you come out the back. Like I just don't know because you've always gone through monstros, so I it wouldn't make any sense ever, for you to have a tail. I don't ever remember seeing a tail. Our last question. I hope you are ready to do some work for this one. This could be a good paper pencil one. There are eleven familiar locations currently on display on the Storybook Land attraction. <gasps> There's what? 11 familiar locations. Oh, okay. Put them in order of when their first movie oh or short debuted. Order. I'll give you a hint. It starts with the three little pigs as a silly symphony short. Wait, 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 wait. The other Put 10. In order of the year? The the year their movie or short debuted. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. So not the way you go through it in the attraction? Not the way you go through it. Okay, so you got the three little pigs. I hang will, on, hang on. I will give you the rest of them in order. Do you want to write... Write them, write down what we think is the the eleven things, and then we'll put That's them in order. That's what I was order. gonna say. Okay, so there's. I was gonna give you those. But oh, if you want to give them to us. Oh, I thought the question was both, and there was a bonus to get them. Oh in order. no, no, no! I just want you to put these in order. Okay, oh. so give it to us. So you have the village of Arendelle and Elsa's ice palace from Frozen. So that's towards the end. You have the manicured London park from Peter Pan. That's in the sixties. The Alpine village from Shh. Pinocchio. That's the, in the 40s. The English village from Alice in Wonderland. That's the 50s. The royal city of Agrabah and the Cave of Wonders 90s. from Aladdin. Prince Eric's Palace and King Triton's Underwater That's Castle from 89. The Little Mermaid. The Cottage of the Dwarfs from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. That's 39. I can't even stop. Hang on. Mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What'd you say, Seven Snow White? Uh, let's see. So we did The Cottage of the Dwarfs from Snow 30. White and the Seven Dwarfs. 39, I think. The French Countryside Village and the Mountaintop Castle from Cinderella. Cinderella. Oh, goodness. That's, that's a hard... Hang that's on, a, hang on. Let's just write them all down and then we'll figure sure. out yours. Stop, stop with your years nonsense. <laughs> well, because it's, it's popping out of my head, so... The Giant's Patchwork Quilt from Lullaby Land, another Silly Symphony short. And Toad Hall oh, Toad. from The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. So when did Ichabod oldest, and Mr. Toad? Oldest first... 
Oldest first. Yes, okay. the Three Little Pigs was the three first of the 11. So, so that's your freebie. Second is Lullaby Land. Third is... What's left that's older? Well... Wouldn't it be Snow White? Did Snow White come before Toad? Snow White was the... Yeah, Toad is not that old. Snow Snow White was the first feature-length animated movie. So. Yeah, but Toad, Toad was two because it was Sleepy Hollow and Toad mushed into one yep. thing. See, I'm not sure when that came. I mean, it must have come out a while ago because for some reason, I know I'm wrong, but my brain was like, oh, that was like 1985. But I know that's 85? not right. No, not Because the attraction's been there longer than so that. I would almost say... T- do you think Toads? Okay, I think I think Arendelle's our last one. That's our easy one. Yes, that's our easy one. So that's eleventh. Yep. Maybe we work backwards. Let's work backwards. Okay. So we got that, um, and then it's going to be Aladdin. It? Yeah. Aladdin was yeah. tenth, and then Mermaid would be tenth, ninth. Yep. And then wait a minute, and then we have a whole mix of things that happen in the middle. Um, okay, well, let's put the middle <laughs> things that we know in order. So Peter Pan would have been was fifty six, I think. Yep. Cinderella was. I don't I know think, where Cinderella I fits. I think later. I think Peter Pan was before. I don't know. Alice was definitely the fifties. So we're we just trying to do Cinderella, let's, Peter Pan. Let's okay. Let's go this way. Let's go Cinderella as as what. I don't think that's right. I was putting her as eight, but I don't think that's right. Because, wh- okay, what's first? First is the pig. Second is the... I think Lullaby Land. Lullaby Land. And toad. then what's our third? You're thinking Toad is third? I think Toad's third. Okay, and well then, then I put... I think Snow White's fourth. Yep. Pinocchio's fifth. Yep. So we've got Cinderella, Peter Pan, and Alice. Well, Peter Pan is bef- Hmm. Alice is before Peter Pan, I think, because Peter Pan was towards the end of Walt's life, and yeah. Alice had been out already. Yeah, Alice was okay. So maybe Alice is actually not the fifth. I don't think it's. It's either late forties, early fifties. Cinderella. So let's do Peter Pan as eighth. This is a tough one. Six. Here I was looking at the seven. time for okay. trivia, and I was like, "This isn't going to okay. be very long at all." So, I knew what I was doing. So. Oldest, you said, was the Little Pigs. Little Pigs came out first. Then we're going to list them as Lullaby Land, Toad, Snow White, Pinocchio, Alice, Cinderella, Peter Pan, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and the oldest or most recent, I guess I should say, the youngest, most recent is Frozen Arendelle. How fun is it? I got to use this question to test your movie history knowledge instead of parks knowledge. Oh, look at you. We probably would have done better if we could have listed what was represented. <laughs> if that was the question. That oh. was a good one. Do you know? Probably. Do you remember the order uh, on the attraction? No. Okay. <laughs> like I was just thinking about it. Peter Pan's pretty close to the beginning i would have said that that well pinocchio's first because you, know, you go through no, monstro because you go through the village you see the village you see pinocchio's you have village. you have storybook li- yeah but you yeah, go, you through, go monstro. through monstro first but he said the village i'm counting the vi- yeah she's oh. counting the village i don't remember where the village is i feel it oh man i'm gonna have to pay closer attention now. toad is towards the end too because toad mm-hmm. toad is like next to arendale isn't it and Little Mermaid is no, last because it's through the, the it's beginning. through the there's the castle. Then you go under the thing, and then her under the sea is off to the side. Anyway, that's yeah. not the question. <laughs> that's not the question, but that could be a great question for the question. future. Write that oh. down, Teresa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all the inspiration we need right there. So, how do you do? Do you have a better movie knowledge than they do? A little more confident. Yeah. Maybe this can get you on Storybook Land Canal Boat. But first, we got to talk to someone who does a little bit better with storytelling. Well, this week for our discussion topic, we are continuing our discussion with Greg Combs. I so, think that's really cool. Yeah. So you mentioned something that I want to ask about because it seems like uh, it's something that Imagineers have been thinking about a lot. And it, it, I've seen posts and stuff about you know attractions like and one that you know about, Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, when you design an attraction or when an attraction is designed like Indiana Jones, uh, it seems like... Uh, it has, from my understanding, and I could be wrong, um, it has never really gone down for an extensive refurbishment since it opened in, like, 95, so that's quite a long time at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, 
when an attraction is designed nowadays, what is that? When, like you kind of talked about it. So what what is that kind of window? How how long is it designed before it would have to go through a, like an extensive refurbishment, or is that something that's even even planned? Because um, hmm. I feel like Indiana Jones needs some love. It's loving. a workhorse. It just oh. goes. <laughs> but it also needs some loving. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. Need some right now. <laughs> well, it, and I must say that's a challenge, right? And I, you know, I don't want to sound like I know more than I really do. <laughs> um, sure. But I'll, I'll tell you, each park has to make those choices. And, and so the park team really is tasked with figuring out that equation of how long can I survive without this attraction? Yeah. yeah. And, and what is it that it needs to maintain a level of quality that we feel is acceptable? And because I know that if I take this attraction down, I'm going to have a lot of unhappy people who came expecting to be able to be on this attraction. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what is it that, that they're expecting when they come and, and what are the things that um, do I need to make sure I follow my sword for to, to make sure are there. It's a very, very difficult. And, and you, so thinking of Indiana Jones, right? There is so much prototype machinery in there. That ride system, the ride vehicle was a one of a kind first ever ride system that motion based on a track like that. And when we were working on that, uh, the gentleman who programmed it, Dave Durham, he, he favorite Imagineer of mine. This guy is just brilliant man. But to watch him program it every night and, and to see him going through and pushing that vehicle to its limits and seeing how far he could get the motion base to move and and how fast he could go around corners and what was you know what was that edge of like oh this is going to induce some nausea we better not do that we better <laughs> dial that one back right. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, what are we doing to the poor maintenance team who's thinking, <laughs> oh, you're really driving those actuators pretty hard, Dave. This is, <laughs> you know, how long can that vehicle last before it has to be pulled out for maintenance, right? How long can can any of and, and that's true of any element where you like you design it with sort of a certain criteria in mind and you think about how far can I push it before I've pushed it beyond its maintainable limits. The rolling ball scene is is a great example of that, right? The the ability for that scene to reset itself in the mm-hmm. amount of time that it has is creates a little bit of challenge from a mechanical standpoint. Um, it, it's, it, it would be interesting to talk to the people who maintain that attraction and, and the operators to get a better understanding of how they feel about it. Hmm. Um, I still feel it's a great experience. I mm-hmm. still am, even though I know how every single thing in that, <laughs> works and I've walked it hundreds of times. I, I'm still blown away by the magic of it, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the new magic that they've added, you know, with the uh, projection mapping that they've done oh, yeah. is, is terrific. I think it just has added to the experience. We put a lot of interactivity in the queue. Yeah. Back, back I when, love that. Yeah, I, I, I do too, but we were infants in our understanding of <laughs> interactivity when we did that. And so a lot of the me- mechanisms we designed, we didn't design very robustly. And so we didn't understand duty cycle as well as we do today. We didn't understand potential failure points as well as we do today. Mm-hmm. And so some of that stuff like the spike room or the well, you know, were designed to operate more frequently than they really do. And, and and it, we that was one that we turned over to maintenance and operations, not well thought out, right? And and I, not casting blame on anybody, right? That was a collective. Mm-hmm. We were learning as we went along on that. Um, it's still a great experience. It's still a fantastic queue. It's you know, it's I, probably the I, best queue anywhere. I feel like it, it's oh. yeah, it's it's amazing. And on that, I, you kind of touched and talked about this earlier, but t- talk to us about immersive queues and being. I mean, you were in involved in two of the first that I can think of because ro- was Roger Rabbit the first fully immersive queue? Um, I can't think, you of- know, there's probably somebody who would argue with me on that, but, sure. but we certainly, when we were designing the Roger Rabbit queue, we put a lot of storytelling in it, Yeah, right? Yeah. Every one of those little alleyways has a deep backstory to it. And so, and it was all, you know, foreshadowing what you were going to experience once you got on Benny the Cab. Um, it, now, as I think back, I mean, you know, cues like Splash Mountain, 
you know, oh, yeah. are are really well done cues, mm -hmm. but I think they are creating more of an atmosphere and ambience mm -hmm. and they're certainly telling a story, but the story isn't as, as maybe focused on foreshadowing events that are coming as it is just putting you in the world mm -hmm. and, and making you part of that environment that you're entering into. It's, it's just crazy. And I, have a, a love hate relationship with immersive cues because I love <laughs> them so much that I just want to sp I want to spend too much time in them because there's just so many layers to well, go that, through. That was know? always the debate, right? Yeah. And when and when we started doing that, it was pre fast pass, so there was no mm -hmm. fast pass yeah, in those yeah. days, right? So it was how do we keep people entertained while they're standing in line? And so we thought, well, let's make the cues more interesting. Let's put more story into the cues. Let's give them something to look at while they're standing there so so that it doesn't feel like such a burden to be standing mm -hmm. here. And, and and then, of course, you realize you sort of run that risk of the cue itself becomes an attraction, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And all you've yeah. done is back the problem up out the door, <laughs> and, right? And then Fast Pass came. Yeah. And Fast Pass changed everything. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly cues that were not designed for that secondary uh, lane, um, we had to accommodate it and think about how we integrate that. And then now if you're in fast pass, you're not spending any time in the queue. Yeah. So that story's lost. And if you were thinking that it was important for them to glean some of those story points before getting on the ride to actually have a meaningful experience, well, now you've done them a disservice, right? Now you've, you've sort of shot yourself in the foot because all those people that rode fast pass are going to get, are not going to get all those story points that you put in there. That's so right. then the balance came of like, all right, how do we entertain standby and make sure that the fast pass people don't miss out on the stuff yeah. that we want to make sure that they understand. And Indiana Jones is so great though, because it you is. start, you start even, like even the outside portion of the queue, you're part yeah. of the story, you're outside the temple, mm -hmm. Um, and and this brings up something that I'm uh, curious of your your kind of opinion on too is one of the th reasons that this queue is so amazing is because it was a necessary evil I guess yeah because you <laughs> yeah. there was no room for Indiana Jones in the park no. you had to put it outside no. the park but then how do you get people from inside the park to outside the park <laughs> and I think about this all the time with Disneyland how some of our favorite things about attractions came about. Because there was some problem that had to be solved. The stretching room right. would never yeah. have been a thing, but it had to get, again, like Indy, had to get outside the berm. Right. So when when an attraction stuff is being designed or, or thought about, um, like it, is that like a fun thing as an Imagineer to work on? <laughs> or is it kind of like, great, we've got this stupid thing we got to figure <laughs> out? Or is it kind of like a fun challenge? Well, I... You know, look, if I'm honest about it, it's both, right? I mean, all of us have that part where we, you know, we want to moan or complain a little bit about, oh, this obstacle in my way. What am I supposed to do with this? Ah. But I was always of the belief that, like, obstacles create great design, right? That's true. It's when you put those barriers in the way, when you give us the challenges, that's when we're at our best. That's when we're at our most creative. Mm -hmm. And... Um, by the time I joined the indie team, they had already solved that problem, right? So I came on um, as a show set designer on that one. And they they had, you know, you think about that people, by the way, that worked on that. Tony Baxter and Skip Lang and and just just really giants of the industry who were who were part of indie. Um, I, they had been through all kinds of iterations of big and here I'm going to tell a story that probably I shouldn't tell, but I'll tell anyway. You know, Indy was not going to be just a Jeep ride, right? It was a three-part experience that oh, was yeah. almost going to be a whole land. It was going to be a whole land, right? There was a Jeep ride, there was a maze walk through, and there was a mine car ride. And so, it, and the story was you had to navigate the maze. And then once you navigated the maze, you would be able to get aboard. And I'll, I'll get this wrong. So Tony or somebody is going to send me a nasty email saying I can post you right. That's all right. But, if Tony's listening to this podcast, yeah, hello, right, Tony. Yeah. We would like to have you on. Yeah, let that <laughs> Tony's fantastic. Oh, he's, he's a great guy. So, <laughs> so you would navigate the maze and then come out and you would get on the Jeep. And then you'd finish yeah. the Jeep ride and you'd get on the mine car. 
And the Jeep and the mine car shared the same show box. So mm. you experience the ride at different levels uh, within the wow. show box. And then for various reasons, most of them having to do with money, they just had to scale it back. And they picked the core essence of what they wanted to, the story to be, which was the Jeep ride, which I think was absolutely the right choice. Oh, yeah. Um, and so by the time I came on board, they had figured all that out. They had figured that the queue was going to start an adventure land from in between Jungle Cruise and, and the treehouse there and then make its way underneath the train tracks and out into the into the parking lot behind and create a show box. And so the first assignment I was given was to work on some of the interactives in the queue and then later the rope bridge and the, and all the effects on the rope bridge. Uh, I got to work on that as well, too. Um, and I was like, this is pretty dang brilliant this is <laughs> and so I, I i would love to say that i was part of that whole decision making process but i had nothing to do with it all i did was try to make it look as good as possible uh in the end there but that's the that was always the fun of imagineering is you're around all these incredible people and and I, honestly that kind of like if i could go back in time I would chain. I would talk to myself and say, "Don't be so afraid of these people." When I first started there, I was so afraid to talk to the Tony Baxters of the world because I saw them as these like deities of design, mm -hmm. and I couldn't talk to them. I was I was afraid to say anything. And I'm like, I'm going to work in my little corner here. I'm going to design my little thing, and hopefully it's okay, and nobody's going to get mad at me. But then later, as I had been around a while, I realized these are warm, friendly, caring, giving people who just love what they do and they just want to share it and they want everybody to love it as much as they do. And, and that team camaraderie, the, it was just like working in theater where in theater, it's not about you as a designer and your individual skills. It's about your ability to tell a story to an audience and emotionally connect. Imagineers, same thing, right? We always used to say, Hey, there's only one name on the front door and it's not ours. <laughs> right. It, it says Disney up there. Doesn't say Greg Combs, doesn't say Tony Baxter, doesn't anything else. Right. And you subjugate your ego for the good of the experience that you're creating for our guests. And I so love that. I that, it, you know, I'm an introvert at heart. So it's like that. I, I'm happier to be part of a community of like minded people than I am being a solo artist, you know, with a spotlight kind of jumping off with Indiana Jones, there was another pretty big attraction that's stood that's a, a favorite in multiple parks, but you got to also be part of Tower of Terror. So what oh, role yeah. did you have with Tower? Um, also show set. So mm -hmm. all those, you know, my early career, like for I'd say the first seven or eight years was show set. And, um, and so I was part of a really great team. Um, that's the first time I worked with um, a good friend of mine, Dan Jew, Dan is now the creative executive in charge of Tokyo, and he and I were partners together for a number of years. Um, still a really close friend of, uh, of mine, and um, he and his family, are, we see them quite often. Um, Dan and I, and, and another great uh, uh, show set designer who then went on to become a great architect, his name's Michael Brown. The three of us got assigned to that. Um, it had initially was going to be a baby Herman ride. And oh, really? So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm learning so many backstories to some of my favorite attractions. That this is, is so, so not what it is today. <laughs> it is not a baby Herman ride. No. It is not a baby. Well, and, you know, there's we can talk forever about the challenges with Roger Rabbit and sure. and that property from an intellectual property standpoint, mm. storytelling standpoint. At that time, though, the company was very invested in seeing what the future of that property might have to to. Uh, to carry on into other avenues of theme parks, merchandise, whatever, right? Um, and for various reasons, the baby Herman ride fizzled out and didn't go anywhere. Meantime, there was this team that was like taking that same ride system and thinking, of, excuse me, um, thinking about how could we um, adapt it to another type of story. And so, again, I wasn't part of the early team that uh, that had uh, worked with. Um, the Rod Serling estate and uh, Rod's widow to develop um, and get permission to develop a Twilight mm -hmm. Zone themed mm -hmm. attraction. And so they had this idea for a drop ride, um, it, which you got to <laughs> think about this for a second, right? So they, they had approached Otis Elevator 
um, <laughs> to help us with the ride system because we didn't know how we were going to do the ride yeah. system at that time. And poor Otis Elevator, they're looking at us going, you know all the things you want us to do with this ride? These are all the things that we've tried to engineer out of elevators. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we try to not make elevators drop like that. We try to not make elevators go faster than gravity, right? I mean, that's just, <laughs> guys are nuts. And so they had this really incredible idea and just needed to flush out the storytelling from beginning to end, putting it in this hotel that was haunted. There was this whole backstory of, of what had happened on this fateful night and um, that we were all going to experience it. And so myself with Dan and, and Michael and, and, and a team, you know, a big team of people um, got to start figuring out how to flush it all out and how to create um, most of what I worked on was the boiler room uh, right before you get into the right vehicle. And then uh, the hallway scene that has the pepper's ghost effect, which one of my favorites, I just think that yes. seems brilliant. That plays out. It's a simple scene. It works beautifully. And then the scene I love to hate, which is the <laughs> fifth dimension. So the fifth dimension is the scene where you you've come up in your, your elevator uh, cab, the cab, or the elevator doors open mm -hmm. and your vehicle leaves the elevator shaft, yep. which to me is just this amazing mind blowing experience, right? Like, cause we all know what an elevator does, but we don't ever expect for the elevator to suddenly go sideways. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so the doors open, you leave the elevator and now you're meandering down this passageway and you eventually enter into another elevator shaft and then you complete your journey. Mm -hmm. Right. I now you people are probably not the right ones to ask this question. I would <laughs> love to get some guests who have just been on the ride for the very first time and know nothing about the ride and ask them, what did they just see in that scene? What did you just see when you went from one elevator shaft to the other? All I remember is I remember this weird googly eye thing off mm -hmm. to the side, yep. <laughs> um, which I was now I'm sorry. I hope this... Maybe this is where you're going with this. Yeah, um, go ahead. Go ahead. My I, first experience with Tower of Terror was the California version, which there's a lot of things I really liked about the California version. Sure. So I rode the Disney World version, you know, after dozens of times on the California version. And I was very excited for this fifth dimension because everybody said it was so amazing. Yeah. And I remember just going, it seems like the fifth dimension is where they, like, their budget... Ran out. And they're, putting, they're putting some of these weird, um, like carnival funhouse kind of feeling things in here. This isn't at all what I expected this to be like. And then the rest you of the attraction a, was fine. You have the overhype, <clears throat> like high expectation, and then you get. I guess. Like, oh, <clears throat> see, I my first memory of it was just the confusion of why am I moving forward? Like right. then the that like gave me that sense of is that like. Am I going to be safe when we start going all over the place? Because I know this wasn't secured, you know, like that kind of thought process no. was mine. I just that remembered a lot like of <laughs> blue, yeah, a lot of blue and kind of like mirror and like lights. I don't remember the details all right. of it. As all well. right, so let me tell you the story now. <laughs> let me tell you what you what you were what in, we missed. What you were? No, you didn't miss it. We failed to deliver. Right. Oh, this is okay. this is Ooh. us. Okay. Right. So because uh, honestly. This is the challenge of designing in a theme oh, park. Yeah. It's that 14 seconds you get to tell a story. And how do you tell that story so it's clear, so that everybody understands it? So the idea was the Twilight Zone, the original show from, you know, 50s into I think the early 60s, played a lot with um, top, with genre, the science fiction genre where you could – change time and space and weird things would happen, right? So we expected that the audience would already sort of be attuned that if we call this Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, that that's kind of what you should expect. The idea was, as the shaft of the elevator opened, you, we were warping space and time and you were going into this fifth dimension. And what you're supposed to see when the doors open, but... I don't think anybody knows this, is that the elevator shaft has bent sideways. Oh. And now you're in a sideways elevator shaft. And if you look closely at the walls and some of the cues and the theming, when you first come out of the shaft, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll, you might notice that, but you wouldn't notice it unless I had told you to look for it. 
And then the idea is the walls go from solid to dissolving okay. to okay. this infinite void that is the mm -hmm. fifth dimension. And the elements that you see there are taken from the original TV series opening credit roll. And so in the opening credits of Twilight Zone, there was a big I that appeared. There was E equals MC squared uh, floating in a star field. There were these, these icons that if you were a fan of Twilight Zone and you understood, you knew that series, you would see those elements and go, oh, I'm in, I'm in the Twilight Zone now. I've just entered, I've just passed through to the Twilight Zone. And the... Other idea was that in the eye itself, you would see yourself. Because when you were in the hallway, we took a picture of you. That's the place where we take your um, first picture. Now, we take another picture of you when you do the drop, right? But we were going to take a picture of you in the hallway. And then we were going to put that picture in the eyeball. Mm. So that as you come down the fifth dimension, you see yourself in the eye and then course you're like well uh, what am i doing in the eye of this <laughs> thing over here and then you go into the other shaft and you go up and down and and you leave having a great time so we put all this effort into it and i can tell you that was a tremendous amount of mock-ups and meetings and special effects tests and all kinds of things to try to make that work and that's why it's the scene i love to hate because I love that you leave the elevator shaft and I love that kind of experience, but I know we fell short. I know we didn't deliver on the intent of the story that we were trying to tell there. And, and frankly, that's why when they replicated the attraction in California and Paris and also in Tokyo, um, nobody was willing to fall on their sword over that, right? Nobody wanted to say, well, we got to have both elevator shafts. We got to have the fifth dimension. Everybody's like, I never understood that scene anyway. So, <laughs> so. But, but one of the things that I missed the most from the California and Paris version was I loved the effect that as you're as you you've been on the California and Paris oh, yeah. I'm sure you've oh, been, many yeah. times. Yeah, many. I love when you back up from the door and it turns into the star field. Mm. Like I loved that effect. Yeah. And when when it became Guardians. Yeah. Uh and and it, like, I love Rocket, but yeah. I loved that Starfield more. <laughs> I, I bless you for saying that, Tag. I, I, I totally agree with you on that. That Starfield yeah. was a beautiful thing. It was a. Yeah. It was so cool. And the other thing I've got to say about about, I think it was both. I'd only ridden Tower of Terror in Florida like twice, um, but that that elevator mechanism is so it's, smooth yeah mm -hmm. it feels so nice like before it starts like <laughs> flinging you everywhere right um and and again you kind of lose that with guardians because it's more i mean there's a little bit of bounce which is kind of fun in the mm -hmm. but but you, you don't the thing i liked a lot with the original thing was it would take you up to that first you know show scene yeah. and then it would yeah. take you to the next it was like it felt like an elevator it but did. really it smooth I, I think it's neat that it's the same thing that they were able to reprogram. We have oh, such yeah. a different feeling now. Definitely. A absolutely. I, I'll tell you, it, you know, look, I'm again, I'm an old guy and I'm a sentimental <laughs> sentimentalist for some of these things. And so when they did the Guardians overlay of the California version, even though I considered, look, and I'll get hate mail on this one, too. I consider the California version inferior. Right. The Florida Tower is the only true tower. Blah, blah, blah. Right. I'll, <laughs> sure. I'm out. I'm out. There it is. <laughs> but when I heard they were doing Guardians, I'm like, oh, that's terrible. I can't believe they're doing that. I if I were, you know, a season pass yeah. holder, I'd protest or something. I don't know mm -hmm. what, right? And so when I went to write it after they had uh, completed it and, and went to experience it, I went, oh, this is actually <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> I actually really like what they did here. And, I feel, and, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Drew. I was going to say, I feel like we have the same exact thing. We were very, yeah. very hesitant, well. very, very <laughs> upset about it. Right. And then the first time I wrote it, I was like okay okay like you can't and then everyone's like well compare it between the two i'm like you, you, you can't they're so it's the same thing but it's not at all it's so different and then tag had a very very interesting <laughs> first time but what happened tag so i told so i told you earlier about 
uh, you know, like Splash Mountain or any of those attractions that like yeah. you try to look really, you know, tough. Right, right. So we had an exchange student that was able to go with us, and it, and it was our 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 first or second day or something in the park, and it ended up being his favorite attraction in the end. But I was used to the original where the doors close and it mm. gingerly takes you up to the first show scene. Yeah. Well, for those people who have been on Guardians, they know that that is not what happens. The door closes and they launch you. Yep. So I'm sitting there and I'm telling telling our exchange student, I'm like, oh, yeah, this could be so cool. You just wait for it. Like, just chill. I'm sitting there all chill. The thing launches. <laughs> and I grab. I'm not I'm not in my normal corner seat. So I've got. Yeah, now he needs now he I'm, needs to be in the corner because I'm, of the launch. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I grabbed our exchange student's leg. And I grabbed the strange man's leg next to me yeah. because I couldn't find my hand grip, and and I was like, okay, we're we're going there. That's um, fantastic. You're our you're our best audience, Tig. That's fantastic. Yeah, great. He he was caught so off guard, and even after I was like, so what do you think? He's like, I. I don't know. He was just so shaken by. I was like, I don't think I'm going to go on knew, that one again. Yep, thinking he knew exactly what was going to happen and having it completely flipped on its head. So, but then now Teresa's we've... husband, he gets on this thing, and he puts his arms up and he goes right. back and forth with the music and the whole time. like. I wouldn't even be surprised if he like, you know, made his belt looser or whatever. <laughs> like right. when they're checking his belt, so he can like get some more air time. He doesn't care. I'm the guy who's like, I'm trying to get that corner seat so I can keep my right arm firmly grabbed onto the thing <laughs> while I put my left arm up for the photo. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. Let's see. I'm, 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 we got Where totally we? off. Yeah. Where yeah. were we? <laughs> so I have a, so um, you're the first person that I think we've talked to that has a lot of um, – a lot of overseas park mm-hmm. experience with things. Mm. And even though we're a Disneyland podcast, I would like to kind of talk about a little bit about those overseas things. Um, one is, you know, because you, you worked on uh, Tokyo Disney sea, you can probably speak to this, hopefully of the, the thing that I always bring up to people is the U S parks are always um, budget conscious, I guess is the, mm-hmm. is the way mm-hmm. to do it. Where I feel like Tokyo and the Oriental Land Company is here's a blank check, Imagineering, make something nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're gonna go there, are you, Tag? Okay. Well, all right. People all right. say Disney Sea is the best Disney park anywhere yeah. in the world, and well, they're every, right. They're and, correct and, about that. Right. Yeah, they're correct. and it seems to me like the it, the it people who run like Tokyo spend lots of money to build attractions. They don't get cheapy uh, versions of things. Well. All right. Are Boy. you going to tell me I'm wrong? Uh, no, I'm back. Well, yes, I'm going to tell you you're wrong, but um, oh, okay. I'm going to I'm going to tell you you're wrong in a very polite way. And, and, okay. and, and so, well, and and you're probably not wrong, but oh, okay. there is definitely a difference of opinion. I think, and and it's very difficult. Uh, and I'm, you know, I say this with love and respect for all my fellow Imagineers and people that have worked in all the different parks. In, in every location, every geographic location has its own issues, right? Its mm-hmm. own challenges, its own benefits. Um, and Tokyo is very unique because it's the one park we don't own yeah. in any respect, right? Oriental Land Company is the owner operator of that park. We have a wonderful agreement and relationship with them. And by the way, they're, it's just my favorite place in the world. Um, I lived there five years. I um, have done um, the majority of my career was really spent working in some degree or another in Tokyo. And I remember while we were working on Tokyo Disney Sea, Disney's California Adventure was being designed at the yeah. same time, and we would pass each other in the hallways, right? And we would, <laughs> you know, now we were in one building and they were in another building. Um, but we would see each other in the cafeteria, out in the common areas, we, you know, uh, see each other in the model shop and places like that. And we'd kind of look and go, what are you doing? <laughs> and they would look at us with kind of longing and think, gosh, I'd love to work on that. That would be fun. Now, look, no disrespect, but what DCA has become to me, I think, mm-hmm. is tremendous. And what... The people who worked on DCA when it first opened, what they did was exactly what the company asked them to do, mm-hmm. and and they delivered it. Now, 
there were some things that maybe they were asked to do that in hindsight we said, well, yeah, you know, that probably wasn't the right way to approach that. But at that moment in time, there was some belief that it was the right thing to do. Mm. Um, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? We get to look back on these things and criticize them. But in the moment when you're in the middle of it, it's very difficult to know for sure. Um, these are my friends. These are these are people that I love and admire who who have all worked on these things, and they're highly talented, smart people. Um, Oriental Land Company, we'll see, has. Look, we had budgets, we had schedules, we were held uh, feet to the fire um, on every aspect of that. Now, what what is very difficult for us to understand at WDI is we did not, you know, OLC does not work with an open book with us. They do not show us how much they're spending on the things that they manage, the facility aspects of it, mm-hmm. the local general contractors, engineering firms, all of that stuff. We give them the design of what we want and they then go negotiate and figure out how to get that done. How much they spend on that, I don't know. I can't tell you. Um, I can tell you the efforts that we went through to produce the show elements, the things we refer, when we work with Oriental Land Company, the things that we provide, we refer to as DFI, Disney Furnished Items. So the DFI that we would be responsible for was akin to the same uh, equivalent things in any other Disney park. It, it, we, um, we did shows in the very same way DCA did shows or the way Florida did shows or Paris did shows. Um, I think OLC had a patience for design process and continues, I think, to this day, though, there's my friend Dan, who I mentioned earlier, who continues to lead the Tokyo portfolio. Um, if he were on this call with us, he'd probably say, eh, the patience is starting to wear out. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, nothing stays the same forever. But there were people... What had happened with OLC is they sent a number of people to the U.S. to be trained um, prior to the opening of Tokyo Disneyland. And during that time, they saw firsthand and learned how Disney designed and operated and maintained theme parks. And they took those learnings with them back to Japan. And they figured out how to improve upon it, how to make it better, how to really put in a process and... The thing that they do that I think is better than anybody else is they hold us accountable to our process. They don't let us cut corners. They, they say, you're going to go through these phases of design. We are going to make decisions at each of these phases. You're going to come out of each of these phases of design with certain deliverables. And if you don't, they don't let you go forward. They, mm. they make you stop. And they say, no, do your job, WDI. Get it done right. Where when it's our money, you know, when it's Disney money and we're spending mm-hmm. it, we say, oh, we maybe didn't get everything done this phase of design. That's okay. We'll catch up next phase. Right. Well, because we're we're Disney. We got it. We know we're, we're going to be OK. We have we have a confidence in ourselves that we know what we're, we we've done this enough times. We've got it. So we sometimes fall victim of our belief that we know more than we really do. Mm. OLC doesn't have to trust us, right? <laughs> they, they can stop us and say, no, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. And I need you to do, because I, OLC, I'm paying you. Mm-hmm. This is my money that I'm giving you. I expect you to do what you say. And to me, that's the simplest way to boil it down, is OLC holds us accountable for what we say we're going to do. The other thing I think that's interesting, and you kind of brought it up too, is just look at DCA and Tokyo being done at the same time and how differently those two projects kind of came. I think the Orient- the Oriental Land Company and Tokyo Disney Sea came from a lot more excitement whereas maybe DCA was just a little bit not fear but it was just a, it was just a little bit more safe feeling. They weren't quite willing to go out on a limb. I feel like they did um, for Tokyo Disney Sea, and you know, and they thought that that was the right choice, and it yeah. it worked for some time, but then it didn't, and then they've just built on it. And I think what's really neat 
is seeing the progression of DCA, what it was on opening day to what it is now. It's almost, it's like, you yeah. could almost say it's two different parks. And I think it's it's cool that they didn't just say, nope, this is what it is and we're sticking with it. And they, right. you know, learn from, learn from the past and pushed forward. I mean, look yeah, at I, Radiator I, Springs. I, I think you're right, Teresa, but I'll, I'm going to disagree with you just on, yeah. the, on a minor or maybe, I don't know. You tell me if it's minor. <laughs> I don't think at DCA they were playing it safe. I think at DCA they took a big risk. They chose at DCA. Look, the company always is trying to reinvent itself and say, how can we do this better? But also, how can we get more bang for the buck? How can we do this faster? You, you were talking earlier. Why can't we get things to, to market faster? Why, why does it take so long to design an attraction? DCA set out to try to break the mold of how we do theme parks, of how we design. They took risks. They tried things. And sometimes when you take risks, they don't always work out. But the company was willing to let them do that and fail and succeed at the same time. Let's be clear. DCA, I think, today is seen as success. You said mm -hmm. the, as the company was willing to look at that and look at the things that didn't work as well as we wanted to and say, all right, let's put some money into this and let's fix it. And... That's what I love about it, right? Is that the company said, okay, we told you to take a risk. You did. Eh, we're not happy with all the risks. Let's go back and fix some of this stuff. Um, we'll see. Now, TDS is kind of an interesting one, right? In, in some ways, they, they took a big risk mm -hmm. because they let us produce a park there that quite honestly was a park that we as Americans wanted. It was, it was a park that when we designed and built that park, we all said, this is the park we would go to in a heartbeat. This is the one that we wish we could make in California or Florida and take our families to. We didn't actually think that much about what the Japanese audience would think about it. Oh, sure. And and and, and I think I can say that having been part of that team and, and be honest about it, mm -hmm. is that we got a little yeah. culturally arrogant in our approach and when the park first opened, it was not successful. It mm. did not go over well. Because we had raised our audience over there on Tokyo Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Now, you think about this, right? That audience over there did not grow up with Walt in their living rooms on television. They did not grow up with the wonderful world of Disney, with the movies as part of their rite of passage as a child. Um they were certainly aware of the movies, but movie going is a very different experience in Japan than it is in the U.S. It is it is not the same cultural impact as it is here. And so we thought, well, just because it's Disney, as long as we tell great stories that are um, true to what we believe a Disney experience should be, well, the Japanese audience will naturally love it. What we created was a very real park, though. It was real places, you know, um, even though they were maybe based on fiction like Mysterious Island, the atmosphere of Mysterious Island has a very real feel to it. The entrance is not Main Street USA. It's the Portofino. It's it, Italy. It's the Mediterranean. Um, you have American Waterfront. You have Cape Cod. You have Lost River Delta. You have you have these places that feel like I've gone on a real journey somewhere. And our Japanese audience went, yeah, but where's Mickey and Minnie? Where's Donald and Pluto? Where's Chip and Dale? Where's Donald and Daisy? And mm -hmm. we said, oh, no, they're over in Disneyland. Right. And they're like, great, we'll go to Disneyland. And we'll, <laughs> we're going to be over there. We'll yeah. see you later, right? Wow, and, yeah. And so for like the next five years, you know, because I want to be honest and, and not just – uh, criticize DCA for having to be fixed after opening. We had to fix TDS too. We had, we had to fix it because we missed the mark. And, and we created some things that we're very proud of. But at the same time, we have to be thinking about our guests and what are our guests expect. And, and so we had to start, we, we, we weren't going to character slap, you know, onto attractions, but what we had to do, was give those experiences to our audience there that made them understand, yes, this is Disney. You are in a Disney park. Mm -hmm. And so that everything from the live entertainment to um, the attractions we modified or changed over time, like Simbad, 
um, what was a famous one that we had to change, um, all had to have a different approach to them um, to reflect and be respectful of uh, who we were telling our stories to. And that was something that I think then from that point forward, we started to become much more aware of when we went to Hong Kong, when we went to Shanghai and went back to Paris, uh, we started to become much more understanding of who are we telling our stories to. And, and even domestically, uh, it, it's a fair criticism to say domestically, we hadn't done a good job of understanding our audience. And we did, we did a lot of soul searching to figure out how we could do that better. I was going to say, it seems like Disney has had this a few times because mm-hmm. wasn't that the complaint with Epcot too, was there was no Disney oh, yeah. characters. So people mm-hmm. were upset. And then DCA in the beginning didn't have Disney characters and people were like, well, where's the Disney characters? And then, mm-hmm. So it just seems like people come to Disney to see Disney and a lot of times those are the characters, which, uh, Teresa, you had a point. I have a question that leads into this, but I want to make sure you get your chance to make your point too. I, I was just going to say thank you for sharing that, Greg, because I mm-hmm. think both Tag and I, as well as probably a lot of our listeners, we we just look at Tokyo Disney Sea as this kind of like, like you were saying, like this perfect park and just this, <laughs> you know, the crown jewel and whatever. So it that was very eye opening to hear, you know, the reality of it because we just it's this dream for us. So I think that was really really interesting to hear that. No, it it actually wasn't the be all end all when we opened, and it had its. You know, it's bumps in the road just like DCA did because I think a lot of, especially of those of us that love Disneyland, you know, kind of think about the first few years of DCA and we're like, you know, what happened? So it's it's interesting to hear that that you know wasn't just the you know a one time thing and it happened to, it happened to us, but it happens you know other places too, especially places that, like I said, we kind of have put on this pedestal in our mind. <laughs> Right. And and look, we're all guilty of doing it, right? I mm-hmm. I still will be the first one to trumpet PBS <laughs> as the best park that we've ever done. Yeah. Um, and, and I continue to believe that. Now, I say that also knowing when Paris was designed, I think Paris was the most beautiful design I've ever seen. Oh, I, I, to this so day, beautiful. Main it's Street gorgeous. Paris, the castle, the pirates in Paris, uh, Big Thunder in Paris. These were gorgeous attractions i mean it just mm-hmm. designed with love and and passion and these the i was in awe of that team and i was just this young kid who was just mm-hmm. learning how what imagining was i didn't even know what i was doing on that on that job so i i don't claim any credit for any of that i, I just but i appreciated what i saw mm-hmm. was design skills at its highest level uh, it really was and um you know, the challenges there have been well documented and I'm sure well understood by you and your listeners, but um, it, it still, there's, I have a soft spot in my heart for Paris because of that. And I think Tokyo Disney Sea has some of that same level of passion and care to the design and the storytelling and the placemaking. Everybody who worked on that was just so committed. We all knew it was something special when we worked on it. We weren't naive about it mm-hmm. and and in many ways because dca got all the attention because dca was just down the five freeway mm-hmm. and so everybody would go down there and corporate would go down there and everybody would look at it and they got all the attention and we on tokyo disney sea felt a little neglected mm-hmm. we were like hey does anybody care about what we're doing and and in many ways we also felt like boy i hope they don't find out what we're doing because <laughs> they're going to make a stop and they're not going to want us to do this but um and you know, there were some things that we probably shouldn't have done. Um, it, obviously, you know, I mentioned the missing the mark with the audience, but, you know, there were some other things as well, too, that, yeah, we, it, it was a difficult thing. We didn't think through live entertainment in that park very well from a, a large experience. You know, parades are very popular. And so the parade route in TDL is probably one of the most desired and sought after experiences you know the guests in japan you know when i was there for sqs i noticed this firsthand they come for those live experiences the rides are something they do in between right but seeing the favorite character whether it be in a parade or a meet and greet or a live show to them that is that's the mecca that's the reason you come um and and the attractions they certainly enjoy but 
it, it's almost the reverse in the U.S., right? Where yeah. people come for the attractions, and then the live experiences tend to be not not always, but tend to be things you do in between mm -hmm. your favorite attraction. In TDS, the, there is no parade route, right? There's oh. a there's a lagoon for a water show. There's a Mediterranean Harbor for the water show, but there's no parade that goes through the park or or parade route, even if we wanted to do one. And because we thought, oh, TDL is where you do parades. And that was one of the, the dissatisfiers with our guests is they were like, well, where's the parade? We want to see a parade because <laughs> we had trained them that that's what you do when you go to a park is you see a parade. Wow. V victim of your own success uh, <laughs> uh, almost with that. Like you were so successful with that that you're like, oh, I guess we have to do that again. OK. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, well, and it's, it's interesting because I'm sure I mean, it's one of those things. And, you know, we don't want to make it sound like we're hating on the creative teams no. and the Imagineers that came up no. with these things. But it's one of those things, I'm sure, when you're at, you know, when you're at the table and when you're creating it versus in the mm -hmm. reality, you just, you don't know. You don't know what's what's going to hit, what's not going to hit, what's going to be important, what, you know, what you thought was going to be important. Maybe nobody, the guests don't seem to care about. That's got to be such a weird um, feeling to kind of, open that and like re release that to the public and see, right. You know, kind of sit there with your breath held, what's going to happen. And then, then having those, like you said, kind of those things later that you're like, Oh, parade route. We, and you can't, that's not something you can just add. It's not like it's an right. attraction that you can just, you know, redo or something. That's it. That's just how it is now. I was going to say, that's the challenge of that entertainment yeah. narrative form. Right. So when you do a TV show or a movie and if it bombs, right, you go, Oh, well that was, a lot of money and I'm really you know, upset about that. But then it's out of the consciousness. It's out of the, the public mind almost as quickly as it came in. When you misstep on a theme park, it's there to remind you for a long time. Right? <laughs> you get to stare it in the face every day. You get to think about it every time you're walking through the park. You're like, oh, why did we do that? Why didn't mm -hmm. we make a different choice there? And so it, when you spend, you know, because a typical attraction is five years from beginning blue sky to opening day. When you spend five years of your life on yeah. something like that and then to go, oh, we <laughs> missed it. Dang it. It's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's a really hard pill to swallow. We'll conclude our interview with Greg Combs next week. It's okay. I'll be the only weekly tier without an answer. Make sure you send your questions to producer James or producer Vern at trivia at doweekly.net. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Time to wrap up the podcast with our trivia answers. How do you two feel you did this week? Uh, I'm very curious about the last oh, yeah, question for an for his answer. Very curious about that. Me too. Yes, I believe you would be. But before we jump into our Disney movie history, we got three more to go first. And I got some fun facts along the way as well. So question one, Storybook Land Canal Boats was previously named Canal Boats of the World. Well done, Ooh. you two. Points all around. Only Thank after you. a couple of months in operation, Canal Boats of the World shut down in September 1955. Didn't take long for it to be transformed. It reopened June the next year. Poor, poor Canal Boats, because it was just like dirt. Yeah. Weeds. It was a muddy <laughs> mess. Uh, with fancy names on yeah, them. Yeah, fancy names next to the weeds to make it look better than it was. Poor, poor Canal Boats. Question number two, why would someone rush to be first in line for this attraction? As you both said, to sign the captain's log for the day. Woohoo! Captain's log, start eight four eight three eight point seven. Yes. We're at Disneyland. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, this definitely grew in popularity after uh, TikTok showed up. Oh, I'm sure. Of this happening. And a uh, cast member duetted it, which means they commented on the TikTok, uh, sharing memories and love for the new tradition. They're apparently working on their second book now because the first one has been filled up. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. And it only started in 2018, so pretty new tradition. Hmm. I wonder where they keep it, like, when it's full, like the full books. Oh, yeah. Great question. Send it to the archive, right? I, maybe. That'd be cool. The Storybook Land Canal Boats Archive. <laughs> it's a little little mini version. Yeah, yeah. He's so cute. <laughs> Our third question, maybe testing your Mandela effect knowledge, true or false? Monster used to have a tail. I couldn't fool you to <laughs> false. <laughs> I just make that one up. I did. 
<laughs> I was looking through a lot of images because I'm like, maybe at some point. I mean, Monstro went through an evolution. The the teeth are so different nowadays compared to what it was before. The old teeth are terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. It's probably more true for what a whale looks like because I, I think Monstro nowadays has gums and I don't know if whales actually have um, gums. Sure, yep. Uh, amongst a few other details that showed up in it. But it was fascinating to see uh, the evolution of it. Hmm. So, yeah, if Monstro did have a tail, someone needs to to, to show it to us because I can't find it. <laughs> Monstro, where's your tail at? <laughs> and our last question, there are 11 familiar locations currently on display no. on the Storybook Land attraction. I asked you to put them in order when their first movie or short debuted, starting with Three Little Pigs as a silly symphony short. And... You two are kind of close. <laughs> I'll run you through the order and, and catch you up on, on some of the tripping points. So the second one was Lullaby Land, yeah. the Good Silly job. Symphony Short. Those both came out in the same year, 1933, just a couple months apart. The first animated feature uh, is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, followed by Pinocchio. And then, Pinocchio. And then we get into a run of four... Disney films that came out consecutively, 1949, 1950, 1951, and 1953. Dear Lord. They go in order. The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, mm. Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan. So that was definitely a point that was going to trip you up. And then, concluding, you got the last three in the right I order. I think we got Peter Pan in the right spot. <laughs> you did get by... Peter Pan in the right spot. <laughs> by dumb luck. By, by dumb luck. <laughs> I was just impressed with how recent Peter Pan was compared to the park's opening. That that oh, had yeah. crossed my mind. So, and yet it's still well. Like it really blows today. your mind when Sleeping Beauty's castle was built before Sleeping Beauty came out in fifty nine. That's true. true. Back in I'm the really day. impressed that Toad came out after Snow and Pinocchio. Huh. Not just after. Ten years after. Holy cow! Yeah, I always thought that that was much. Much earlier. Mm -hmm. You thought it was the 80s, so you thought it was much later. Well, much later, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just to make sure we clarify, the last three are Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Frozen. At least we got that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Y'all were alive for those. Makes sense. Now, the real trivia would be, so those sections of Storybook Land, what were there before? Ooh. That or were be they just empty spaces? Because I'm pretty sure Arendelle replaced something or moved something over or something. I... Yeah, I don't know. Now I need to, I feel like I need to go on a deep dive for that and figure that out. We can ask Weekly Tier Stephanie because she worked on the canal boats. You know, you also have a Disneyland encyclopedia that I'm sure will tell you all of this stuff that you never look at things. I don't know if it'd tell me that. We'll look it up. All right. The thing that I did find adorable as I was reading about this is the doors and the windows on the buildings of the miniatures actually do open and close. Oh. Because, uh, you know, you got to change the light bulbs somehow. <laughs> Oh, clever. I thought so, they just picked the whole thing up and... Yeah, you think, nope, the door's opening. Close. Hopefully they use they LED do. lights so they don't have to change them as much anymore. Oh, that would be smart. So, Weekly Tears, did you uh, enjoy our journey along the canals through the uh, stories of Storybook Land? I had a good time. Seemed like the host did, too. What do you think we should look at next? Send us your trivia questions or ideas. Our email, me and Vern, trivia at dealweekly.net. Well, we will be back next week with more Disneyland news and information. Until then, go out and enjoy the parks. Please remain seated until the podcast comes to a complete stop and the doors have opened. Then collect your belongings, watch your head, and step carefully from the episode. On behalf of all of our crew, thanks for traveling with us. And we hope you have a happy and memorable visit here at DL Weekly. <laughs>